Hello, Wine World. Welcome to Silicon Valley Bank's 2020 video cast. This one's live. Uh, the State of the Industry Report. We are super excited to offer up our thoughts and views for the things that uh, we're predicting and the things that we've uh, observed in the last year. Um, I'm the host for today's discussion, as you guys might might know by now. But I always like to to uh, talk about who actually is tuning in. We have people from pretty much every wine producing country in the world. Um, uh, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Croatia, France, Germany, Israel, Italy, Mexico, Netherlands, New Zealand, Portugal, Republic of Georgia, Romania, Singapore, Slovakia, South Africa, Sweden, the UK, Uruguay, and of course the US. And I didn't know that Singapore actually was a wine producing country, but uh, actually it's a, it's a pretty good export country which uh, maybe some people in the wine industry would be interested in, given some of the things that we've discovered in our report. Um, this is part one of the discussion. Part two of the discussion will actually be uh, airing next Tuesday at 9.30. If you haven't signed up for part two, you can do that. Um, easiest way is to go to my blog, SVB on Wine. That's SVB on Wine. And uh, just find the, the same link that you signed up for this if you use my blog. And, you can go in there and find uh, part two will be, will be there. Uh, before we get started, I always have to read these housekeeping things. Um, uh, at the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A icon. Q&A icon goes to the panel. There's also a chat panel um, on there as well. And the chat is more for lateral communications with the other people that are, uh, that are listening in today. So if you want to give a shout out to your peers right now through that chat panel, type your message into the, into the group chat widget at the bottom of the screen at any time. Tell them where you're from, country, winery, whatever. Um, any questions, uh, you can also, uh, like technical difficulties today, you can also use the Q&A widget. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll kind of break into it. I wanted to start, though, this time uh, thanking really the, uh, the wine industry and community because uh, as some of you probably know that follow, um, last year I got to the point where I almost decided to stop doing the research. And um, the reason I did is because we hit a point in our survey where I couldn't get anybody to respond. And, and I recognize that it's, the, especially for this part of the survey, it's during harvest. But this really is a partnership between Silicon Valley Bank and the industry. It's something that we give away. We don't charge for any of this. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars in studio time and marketing and research. It's, it's a lot of work that goes into it. But if I, if I don't get the participation of the industry, then I lack that primary research that I really need to, to be able to come together, come, come up with, uh, uh, decent predictions and and you know a look at the business. So uh, I wanted to start by reminding everybody the importance of the survey. Um, I'd ask you when the survey comes out, the direct consumer survey component will come out um, in the spring, and I'd ask you to please fill that out and please forward it to other people in the industry uh, that would benefit. I, I think um, I've discovered that people really do do want to hear this information. Uh, we ended up with a almost record performance in terms of uh, people that responded to the survey by the time it ended. So it was a humongous push in the last week uh, we got there. And I think we ended up with some pretty interesting results and I'm gonna be really happy to, to talk about them today. Before that though, um, I think we need to have our panel introduce themselves. Amy, please. Well, Rob, it's great to be back. I'm Amy Hoops. I am the president at Wente Family Estates. Hi, I'm uh, Juliana Colangelo. Thanks for having me, Rob. I'm the West Coast Director at Colangelo and Partners. We're an integrated communications agency specializing uh, in wine. Doctor? Yes, uh, <laughs> Paul Maybray, and good to be back. And I run Emetry, a consumer insights company. Doctor Digital, as I call him. Yes. <laughs> Cheers to that. Um, so that's it uh, in the background stuff. Let's, let's, cut, let's cut right to the discussion. Um, and probably the thing that is largest on people's mind is oversupply right now. You know, where are we? What does it mean? Why did it happen? So um, I'm going to start with a few slides just to tee up the, the conversation. If we could start with uh, the, uh, what is it, slide number eight, please. Um, and what this, what this is, it's in the report, but I've broken out North Coast grape prices, their median grape prices over 
a fairly long period of time and kind of broke it into three, uh, three eras, if you will. Um, the, the, the 90s where we saw rapid increase in, uh, in demand and then we, we had this um, period of time in, the, in 2000, it started with the tech bubble um, and all that overplanting caught up. And when the overplanting caught up, we had oversupply for a period of time. And you can kind of see that reflected in the pricing. Um, you can see that little dip uh, around the 2008, 2009, that's, that is the recession that is showing its head. And then over the last decade or so, we've had this rapid increase in grape prices. Um, this, this happens to be Napa, Mendocino, and Sonoma. Um, but you have to ask yourself, you know, why, why would we see an increase in grapes? Typically, if you're going to see an increase in grapes, it, it has to do with that demand. And so if you go back to that, the 1990 segment, you'd say, well, that's obvious. There's an increase in demand. So we responded to that by uh, planting a lot. And, uh, and, and then when the, when the uh, recession hit, the, the um, tech bubble hit, um, that kind of popped that and all of the lingering non-bearing acreage came online. We ended up having to replant. We overshot the mark, as it were. We were able to get out of that pretty quickly, though, because we had such strong growth uh, in demand at that point in time. Um, when you fast forward to the more recent uptick, that's what we end up, that's the bubble that we're actually all feeling right now, in the, especially in the fine wine segments. Um, we were... We had wine producers that really couldn't, couldn't get by the whole notion of, of uh, oh, I had 8% growth this year, so you know what? Demand is slowing. I'm going to actually forecast a year and a half out, two and a half years, whatever. I'm going to forecast lower growth. That's really hard to do. Um, you know, in a competitive group, you have your sales guys say, well, you know, I did 10% last year. We're going to do 6% next year. You know, the owner of the company is going to say, well, baloney. You know, you're sandbagging. Uh, so that's just not going to happen. Um, but that's what we ended up with is the, these increasing grape cr prices over this last period of time without corresponding, um, th that same kind of corresponding growth in demand. That caused the bubble. Then we hit the 218 vintage, which exploded it really. Um, and, and that's where we find ourselves today. Um, if we can go to slide 20 for a second. Uh, here we have a look at what's happened with retail sales um, off-premise. Uh, again, a long period of time, 2014 to 2019. And last year in the report, we pointed out that we were tipping over in volume and starting to turn, turn toward, uh, toward negative growth. Um, it wasn't very well received. People don't like in this industry, the most optimistic of industries to... <laughs> to get this kind of news, but yes, in fact, that is, that is what's happening. Um, and it, it, we can break it out by segments at, at another point, but it really matters when you're talking about volume. That, that black line that's, that's trailing off there, um, that is cases. And so cases matter because if you're a grower, um, you're not selling dollars, you're selling tons. And it's, the, the grower, of course, it matters what their, what their return is. They care about the dollars too, but if we have lower consumer demand in cases and we have too much supply in tons, then really you only have pretty much one solution, which is ripping out vines, um, which is kind of where we find ourselves today. So it's really odd when you look at this graph against the, this chart against the last one where we have increasing prices um, against de decreasing volume. Yes, the higher price point in the North Coast uh, did have some, some growth, but it shouldn't have done what it did to the price. And we will have a permanent reset on, well, every, how long's permanent, but we'll have a reset on price. Um, and we're, we're not gonna see those same kind of prices um, in, the, in the future, at least in the near term. And then let's move to, if we can, to slide uh, six. And um, that's a good look from Ciotti in um, the way they're looking at the market um, today. So um, this, this slide has got an estimated January, um, but as you can see, it is uh, you know, kind of hitting record levels. So it does matter um, where we are. It matters across the board, whether you're in what re you know, different regions is, have different 
uh, factors that, that impact whether or not it's important to you at any given time. Um, Oregon is still in a good spot. Washington is oversupplied as well. Um, but largely the industry finds itself at this point of oversupply. And, and uh, rather than trying to explain it, uh, we're gonna do something a little new and, and uh, have an intrepid reporter on the street and uh, we're gonna cut to him and uh, hear what he has to say about, uh, about supply. Here we are in uh, Silicon Valley Bank's offices in Napa. We're with uh, grape grower and winemaker Glenn Proctor, <laughs> who you uh, may know from, from uh, Ciotti. Um, and uh, I just thought I would bring this bottle of, of Glenn's wine, Puccioni Winery, uh, for you guys to see. And by the way, for the next month, um, he's going to be giving this a 20% discount when you go on his site and put in the term SVB into his promo code and you'll get 20% off. This is about a, what is it, 20? How much, how much is this? 32? $32. 20% off, so like 25, yeah. 26, something like that. I gotta say, it's a great wine. Uh, I bought a case of it myself uh, just so I could convince him to come and do this. <laughs> but Didn't it's, hurt. It's, 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 a, it's an excellent wine. If you like California's Infidel, you miss the good old Zinfandels, and this one is a uh, super old vine. I mean, how many, how many years? Uh, planted in uh, 1904. 1904, that, that's old, that's old. Uh, not as old as me or him. Um, but speaking of that, we have a, um, an interesting time that we're, we're mm -hmm. in, and uh, in my career in the time I've been here, not since 1904, <laughs> um, I've never seen a, a period like this for growers. Talk about that. Yeah, we're in a tough time. I mean, we have, we're in a situation right now where, you know, sales started to slow down yeah. and we've seen that probably in 17, but we just had a very large 18 crop and a lot of that size of that crop was uh, located on the coastal area. So uh, we, we've got inventory, 18 inventory. We've got a lot of inventory in the system in terms of bulk. So wineries are kind of bogged down by that, um, and there really isn't a lot of demand. So it's, it's definitely reminds you of the early 2000s, you know, the late 2000s, uh, and I think we've got a little bit of time before we get through this. And one, because sales aren't really jumping, right? They're, right. they're, they're you'll talk a little, but they're, they're relatively flat uh, at best. And so, and we have a lot of the normal buyers actually are sellers themselves. So the, the market's out of balance, so I think we're gonna to need to see some supply adjustments going forward, and as we do that, i.e. people taking out some older vineyards, uh, potentially, uh, even on the 2019 spot bulk, you know, we have a lot less is being made because people know the market's so tough, they don't really wanna look for having more things to sell in it. Uh, so it's gonna take a little time to work through this uh, as we go, but at some point, buyers are gonna to have to reload, look for some inventory, uh, but they really have to work through that 18, I think, before they can see the light of day yeah. and have a plan going forward. And obviously price is going down. Price is not going up. We'll start there. But yeah, price, I mean, we look at bulk wines, uh, you know, a general thing we've been using in our uh, Ciotti Monthly Report is the prices are down uh, to probably the lowest level they've been in five years on the bulk market as a general uh, when you start looking at grape pricing, we had a number of, you know, basically every major wine growing region of the state last year had fruit that was unpicked. So there really wasn't pricing or demand for that. So yeah, and even when we start to see buyers come back in the market, it's not going to be what you've been used to. I think there's going to be a reset on price um, as you go back in. One of the things I, you know, point to you is it doesn't look like consumers, even at the higher price points, are willing to pay more. So there's some pushback from that, the people buying the wine, uh, that they just don't want to pay as much, whether that's the millennials. So there, there's some pressure in that market. We're all going to have to adjust to that. Yeah, we're not seeing those price increases. And, and speaking of which, uh, uh, contract cancellation, that's probably a, a good thing to bring up, just because yeah. we always have this problem with, uh, with county averages plus 10%. And, yes, and which yeah. which has a tendency to inflate price over a long period of time. But we have cancellations now, so in the grape crush report, we ought to at some point start to see those prices come down next year. Yeah, I mean the grape average pricing, um, you know, that's a compilation of prices over a big period of time, and you've had this plus ten, plus twenty. Um, I, I think you're, as we see more of, and to go back to your first point, people are getting notice. So wineries are saying for supply and price flexibility, I'm giving notice on my existing contracts um, because I, you know, right now supply is almost a little bit of a dirty word. So they're looking for that flexibility. 
um, that's going to put more grapes on the spot market. And those grapes being on the smart spot market, meaning when somebody does come in to buy, it's going to be a much lower price potentially than you're seeing at the average price. So that's going to tend to drive prices down on those average prices as we go forward. So yeah, we don't, we used to be able to go to a winery and say, give me the average because my fruit at least has to be average plus 10. That's probably got, not going to have a lot of weight, uh, at least uh, for the near yeah. term until we see this market correct. Uh, well, with that, we'll, uh, we'll toss it back to the studio. So there we have our expert view of it. Uh, not only is he in the bulk wine and grape market, but he obviously is also a, uh, uh, a winemaker. So he feels it from, from, from every side. And by that wine, uh, that wine is really good, by the way. Um, okay, Glenn, you owe me. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's jump into some, uh, some of the why. So why are, we, why are we dealing with oversupply? Why are we seeing volume declines? Uh, Amy, you have some thoughts? You know? Yeah, Rob, I think you did a great job of talking about and positioning what had happened as we had great growth and acceleration in the industry. We were able to plant and kind of get ahead of things. And now it's caught up to us because we really have to start to pay better attention to what the consumer demand is and the consumer demand not only by the demographics but by the psychographics. So if we can pull up slide uh, seven. We got a lot of questions early on regarding um, what is the impact of cannabis in relationship to how the different generations are choosing to engage in alcohol, Bev, or not. And I think this is a nice slide. It does look at specifically current times for this year, how each of those cohorts are engaging. And what you can see there is what we've been talking about. You've got boomers that continue to um, lay their hand and more, the most engaged in wine, um, but also do engage in other Alcbev, both recent beer and recent liquor, but very, very small on the cannabis side. As you move to the left, which eat each progressive generation, you're seeing Gen X, a little more engagement in cannabis, millennial, even a little more. But then what we see, and from a wine perspective, is that the engagement in wine continues to drop with both mm -hmm. Gen X and millennials. And that does rise concern and contributes to the fact that the demand isn't as high anymore for the grapes that had been planted. So that's part of the oversupply. Yep. I also think it's important when we reference this slide that we do recognize that only 13% of the adult population actually engage in cannabis usage and 59% of um, legal drinking LDAs are actually engaging in Alcabev consumption. So again, I don't think we're as concerned about what's happening with cannabis taking a share, but instead we should take a deeper dive into what's happening within the Alcabev set. So if we can pull up side 12. So just open that up a little bit more. Sure. I think the way you're saying you're expanding um, wine as we try to isolate ourselves into these beer, wine, and spirits category, you're saying the, the the important thing is to pay attention to Alcbev in general. Correct. Mm -hmm. that, that while cannabis does have a small impact on choice, the usage is not so high and prolifer right. pr pr proliferated that we should can be concerned about it. But instead, let's look within Alcbev and see mm -hmm. where the share is going. Right. So slide 12, as we take a look at it here, we can actually see the large amount of crossover and the cross-category um, consumption that's happening. So up here you see exclusive wine. Only 15% of people drink wine only, and that's only producing 4% of the Alcbev dollars. And you can kind of see in the Venn diagram that's shown there, when you look at all wine, beer, and spirits together, it's 27% of the people are cross-category sharing, and it's producing 55% of the value from Alcbev in total. And that's, that's a big shift from where we were before. Absolutely. Um, everybody that I talk to, they if they have a, a debate about my my view of uh, this rotation of boomers and, and uh, millennials, um, they say, well, they're too young. They're only, you know, at the outside, they're only 40. And, um, and, and <laughs> only, yeah. only, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, our Gen Zers are about to become a legal drinking age, right? They're, well, they are. in there. Yeah. Oh, at 21 yeah. and 22, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. that's right, there. yeah. Hey, why don't we pull up, uh, I'm sorry, but let's pull up slide five first. It's an uh, important, uh, important slide. So this is, uh, uh, again, from the survey that we are all grateful your, uh, for your participation. But you look at the consistency of the data and, and the, the number of, con of uh, respondents in this changes consistent or constantly every single year. So, uh, you know, you, you look at this, it's pretty good data. And, and it's, I, I see other uh, information that talks about the percentage of buyers, you know, millennial, Gen X, et cetera. And, and there's differences, but um, it, they all kind of say the same thing. The, the millennials somewhere between call it 10 to 20 percent of, of uh, total consumption, uh, which, isn't, which isn't really enough. And, and 
if you if you want to go back in time and you look at what spurred um, on consumption way back in the middle 90s, it was the French paradox. It was um, uh, questions about health, um, and so that was that was flipped on its head with the French paradox. Arthur Kanzler's, I think, his name was that his work, um, and uh, the Mediterranean diet. Um, so it became good for you. That discussion came <laughs> came to be good for you, but but. As boomers, we really didn't have choices. We all wanted to drink better, but but beer and spirits really weren't premiumized at that point. They really weren't going for better quality. They were still working on, uh, let's produce uh, the lowest ethanol per dollar. That was still the model that appealed to that prior generation, to my generation. Um, so I, I, I interrupted your train of thought, but you wanted to talk about slide 12. No, 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 it's okay. I mean, slide five or slide 12, either way you look at it, I think that the point is the same, that we're seeing different trends in wine consumption as the generations come through. We've been talking about that for the last couple of years, that um, we kind of skipped over the uh, Gen Xers, and we think we're probably right now about in the high point of that five to seven year you know, consumption, um, about to take consumption leadership on the wine side, but more importantly is the fact that the cross category consumption within AlkBev, we need to really dive mm -hmm. deeper to understand what that means for every consumer um, in whatever cohort they're in and what's driving some of these trends so that we understand within the wine industry, what can we do as wine growers, wine makers, and wine marketers mm -hmm. in order to better engage and connect in a relevant way to those consumers. And to add on, yeah, Rob, you mentioned health and that was a factor with the French paradox that spurred boomers to drink. I think health now is being considered in a different way. So we're seeing beverages like White Claw, it's the big elephant in the room. We got a lot of questions about health, about hard seltzer and, and those correlations. 43% of the growth in the RTD category alone, and that's huge. So I think as a wine industry, we need to look at what are other categories like the hard seltzers, um, beer, craft beers, craft spirits, how are they marketing the health message? Because as we know, wine inherently is the most natural product out of the alcoholic beverage categories but it's not being marketed in the way that some of the other alcoholic beverage categories are doing it. And I think that's why they're winning a lot of the market share mm. for a younger generation that's very concerned with their health and what they consume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, as I, as I talk to uh, audiences really in the last, in the last year, um, I, I pointed out this, this shift, and, and it's, it's really been interesting because whenever I talk about how we need to market to the young consumer, um, and change the way we're doing it. We have to evolve, actually. It's not, it's not that we have to stop doing something and start doing something else. We have to continue to do what we're doing and uh, do something else. But I, I kept getting the same question from almost every audience where I had interchange, and, and the question was, well, if the young consumers aren't buying, then why should we market to them? Mm. <laughs> which, which uh, you know, it, it kind of makes, why do you want to spend your money on something that's not going to deliver a return is really the question. And, and the answer is, you've got to engage with that young consumer because I guarantee you the boomer is going to retire. Uh, you know, death and taxes, right? <laughs> that's the only thing that's, that's for sure. And in 10 years, by the way, the median boomer, uh, pardon me, in 10 years, the last boomer hits age 66. So that's what we have in this next decade is uh, an increasing by the year uh, spike in retirement. It's not, it's not linear. It's actually going to increase as we move forward. And at the same time, we have that same sort of a curve uh, with that younger population increasing. So if you think it's feeling like it's coming fast, it is coming mm -hmm. fast. It's, it's accelerating. And, and I, I might add that, you know, you might lose the younger generation if you don't get them now. I mean, if you look at some data on other luxury consumption, millennials make up over 30 percent of, of consumers in the luxury categories outside of beverage alcohol and less than 20 percent, right, in beverage alcohol. So yeah. there are other industries that are doing it well, that are capturing market share, that are making millennials spend more money, whether it's fashion, travel. Uh, and other industries. So I think there is opportunity, and that's the silver lining too, that there is the opportunity there. It just has to be captured the correct way. Yeah. Um. Well, I think it's important too, Juliana, when you started out talking about health, and Rob, you alluded to it, it was something with the French paradox that kind of, you know, all of the boomers know because they grew up hearing it or they were fully engaged in the category, and it's something that the Gen Xers were, were told and believed and followed. So the question is, why have we stopped 
recognizing no. the fact, as you said, mm -hmm. Juliana, that wine is inherently a natural product right. and it can and should be an integrated part of a healthy and balanced lifestyle. And we know that's what all generations are looking for as we continue to age and look at ways that we can be healthier and make better choices, right? So, so how question do we integrate that? The Wine Institute actually came in and asked, how do we promote health benefits when the TTB prohibits that? Which is a good question. It's, right. it's, oh, it's an excellent yeah. question, yeah. Um, and uh, I've been working with the folks in the, in the Wine Institute. They're, they're aware of this problem. For others that aren't aware on, um, in the studio, um, <laughs> the, um, if you're a permit, permit holder, you're, you can't claim health benefits if you're an alcohol producer. Um, you know, it goes back to snake oil, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, there is that regulatory component of it that you've got, you've got to deal with. And, and in fact, I spent, uh, if you look toward the back of the report, there's a, a large section on the World Health Organization and some of the, really the purchase, it's not science, it's purchase. And so <laughs> one, of the, one of the examples that I threw out there was this uh, uh, s study uh, that was done that proved that uh, one bottle of wine consumed a week was like smoking 10 cigarettes, which is, I can't say the word on TV. <laughs> uh, I'm a professional. Uh, but, you know, that's the kind of purchase science that's out there and, and pushing the help. Now, that's the kind of stuff that a permit holder can't do. Uh, but there are things that we can do. But, but, but important to say first is that that is something the Wine Institute could do. And it's not just the Wine Institute. It's, it's uh, any, any of the other uh, agencies that are out there that want to support this industry. You should have, um, you know, whether you're AVA Association or, you know, a, a larger state association, you should have top of mind the science that's out there. And you should be able to, to defend uh, the issue of moderate consumption and, and part of a healthy lifestyle. That is what's in the USDA dietary guidelines, um, w uh, wine and the uh, Mediterranean diet. Um, and so you need to be able to defend that and, and stand up to that component. That's only part of the equation though. There is a lot that we can do as, uh, as industry professionals. Absolutely, and that's what I was gonna say. The other part of the definition around health and what people wanna know isn't necessarily all, always the hard science, which we do have good, significant science that's kind of real versus the debunking, but it is actually recognizing and meeting the consumer where they are in the language mm -hmm. they want. You mentioned yep. it, Juliana. We called it the, the summer sippers and the sizzlers. Right. Those seltzers went out and they spoke the language that consumers were looking for. Absolutely. Hey, I'm on a keto diet. I'm not personally, but consumers mm -hmm. were saying, I'm on keto, I wanna make sure I limit my carbs exactly. and I'm having, you know, my snack packable 100 calorie servings. Right. Now, we as a wine industry can do different things in the way that we are talking about, you know, wine itself. And a question came in I thought was interesting. It said, should we be focusing on making lower calorie wines? Mm -hmm. And my question is, why aren't we promoting the equivalent um, ounce pour that gives you the 100 calorie um, consumption that the right. consumer is looking for, right? So let's switch that conversation and really use the same points of health that people are looking for in the way that we're communicating about this natural product that we're growing and making. And I think there's ways to do it without words. And Paul mentioned, you know, the re legal restrictions. There's video content. Um, I mean, what younger generations are paying attention to online is video. It's user-generated content. Yeah. So create videos of your product out in nature, um, someone active, Having consuming your product, you can say it without words if you know when right. there's not the option to put it directly on the label. Absolutely. Um, let's pull up slide uh, 16 if we could. Um, we've we've been kind of talking. It's a great one. Talking through this, but I like it. Um, you know, when you start to say why are younger consumers cutting back, and there's every indication that younger consumers are consuming less than uh, than the older consumers um, did at a similar point. And, uh, and so, I mean, you look at those top, top ones, 30, 32% opting for a healthier lifestyle, uh, consuming more different alcohol beverage. That's a, that's a big one. That goes to this. Admitting uh, cross-category cra usage. That's right. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, let's see, there's another health, oh, health-related concern. So if, if somebody is, uh, let's say, older and they're taking medication, you have to cut back on your alcohol, something like that. So, But number one right there again, opting for a healthier lifestyle. Again, where have we missed the mark to educate the presumption is educate that the wine generation. consumption is not healthy and, and moderate wine consumption, the science actually shows it is healthy. Right. You have better life outcomes. The mm -hmm. other science that's out there, you know, is, is trying to refute that and push back on it. We haven't done our jobs. But when you, this is I think the, the really thing that's interesting to me is 
all you have to do is look at uh, a consumer product. Uh, uh, Paul's got one at the end of the, of the table, and yeah. and, um, and in that I have this isn't set up. He's actually I like this. Um, whatever whatever it's it is. Water. On, on the back of it, there is uh, you know a, a, a cal bunch of calorie labels. It, it tells you what's what's in it. Um, if you look at the the back of a of a white claw label, um, it tells it tells you what's in it. It's simple ingredients. Um, we as an industry haven't really wanted to put calories, um, and it's it's already set up in the TTB guidelines. Uh, as are other things like gluten. Uh, I mean, who knew? I, I didn't know until I was actually reading the TDB guidelines. It's already set out. We can say that our product is gluten-free. Um, it, it's, already, it's already there. Um, and when you look through um, uh, any kind of consumer products today, you find calories. You find no added sugar. You find words like natural. You find gluten-free. You find no uh, mm. non-GMO. Uh, there's all sorts of little, little icons that are, that are stuck all over it and reference health characteristic. So as a producer, you're, you're able to say things that are true. Um, it's okay to say that your product is gluten-free if it's gluten-free. Um, and I think it's important that we connect with what the consumer is really, look, that young consumer is really looking for. And as one of my, one of my friends said, we're on the side of the angels. <laughs> our, our product mm. is about as natural as it can be and yet we're still talking about warm days and cool nights and pHs and soils, Can which, is, which is great for me. And we, and we still have to talk about some of that, but we've got to, we've got to move the conversation. Can I ask you an honest question? Can Don't be get, honest now. <laughs> no, but the trope that it's only the young consumers that care about these health concerns is, yeah. is a false flag. I mean, it's about Gen X. Mm -hmm. We care about health. Yeah. You care about health. All of these things are true across the generations. It's, right. it's the evolution right. of our culture, I think, about this health thing. So attributing it to the consumer, the younger consumer, is a false attribution, actually, in my mind. I don't know. I don't think it's false. I think that the that there's a point to what you're saying, which is that you know I have become more healthy um, in the way I think about. You look great. Thank you. In the way in the way I think about food, right? Um, but I think the young consumer is, I mean, really dialed in on. They're they're the ones that have driven um, uh, like Whole Foods, you know, natural organics, things like that. Um, that's that younger consumer. But are they the and ones? Gen X. But are they the ones? Because Gen Whole Paycheck, well, Whole Foods. Gen X and, was and definitely you guys are the part of the front end of it, but we weren't a big enough cohort yeah. to have that swing. So as the mm -hmm. millennials Dang joined it. us, it really <laughs> let the tidal wave go. But I would agree that it really is about... Either way, um, it's, it's the same point, right? Yeah. Absolutely. It is the same because, Absolutely. Because it's the message that we're delivering is ineffective for that for a wine consumer. Category. I think that's cool. a better statement then because we're trying to attribute it to the millennials and don't get me wrong, we want to catch the next generation, right. but we should really speak to this point is larger. It's, and it's good for the right. entire that's consumer industry. base. Exactly. And, and that's the point. It is good for the entire um, you know, consumer base and being able to grow and have a longer um, life cycle of them engaging in the wine industry. And the fact that there's such a large cohort of current consumers that know that information, yeah. we have to reteach it to the next mm -hmm. generation because in our silence, there's a whole bunch of you know, false facts getting thrown out yeah. there, and yeah. those consumers then are making other choices mm -hmm. for areas where they see or feel there's more transparency in what it is they're consuming. Right? And I know we talked about that last night, Julian, yeah, and it's absolutely. important. Yeah. What do you think about the, the natural wine movement? How does, I think, that, how does that play into this? I think natural wine has done, has some marketing tactics that have worked really well with a younger consumer. Um, I think they've tapped into the craft better than maybe the larger industry at whole. Uh, they've captured more of that spirit of um, transparency, which is a big key factor for millennials. They want to buy products that they feel are transparent. They know who owns the product. They know who makes it. They know whose feet stomped the grapes. So I think the, the natural wine movement has shown the consumer that transparency that they're looking for when they're consuming anything from. But, but the words have damaged the, the use of the word natural. Yeah, what, it's what it's is made it a touchy wine? topic. I mean, that's yeah. why I giggled when you asked me because I was like, oh right. God, I, mean, I don't <laughs> want to say the wrong thing and it's yeah. going to offend people. But um, I think it's made the, it, Paul, to your point, it's made the term 
uh, hard to use for the whole industry, right? Well, so. It's ruined it for the, the natural, the wine industry is natural by, right. by it's by inherently, nature. by nature, yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't think it needs to have ruined it. I think that's where agreed. we need to step up and we need right. to continue to proactively communicate the right. key points of what those of us that are actively engaged in the industry already know right. and share that with those that aren't actively engaged or that we know want a point of entry and make it easy for them and recognize as people talk about, I want a health and uh, want a healthy and balanced lifestyle, but then we have people taking a dry January, right? Mm -hmm. You're taking a dry January because you, you are, you're a binge drinker? I don't know. Like, can't you just understand that it's okay to have moderate consumption every day of the year? Well, the science right? actually and, says and that- be part of that as a healthy and truly balanced right. instead of going on the, on the peaks That's and right. valleys. Actually, the, mm -hmm. the science says that dry Januaries are not actually helpful. It's the moderation over the year. Of course. And to go back to the that natural helps. wine point, though, I, I think you're absolutely right. The whole industry is natural in general. I think that we have to really focus on um, elevating that, that we're farmers, we're getting grapes from the gland. Mm -hmm. And even though we do science, uh, you know, cultured yeasts or science, using different scientific mm -hmm. methods to get through the wine, that doesn't make it bad. Right. Um, I, I think my favorite saying is from a winemaker in the Azores, he said, everything that nature makes isn't good and everything that man makes isn't bad. I don't mm -hmm. put uranium in my wine and that's natural. <laughs> so, yeah. True. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the, <laughs> Natural does have a, a, a bit of a buzz behind it, uh, both pro and con. On the on the winery side, we get a little bit defensive and we say, "Well, that's not natural wine." Uh, you know, I mean, what's the definition of natural wine? Anybody got one? I don't have one. No additives, no sulfites. Sometimes Who said I think that? there's different. There's Who said different that? interpretations. Um, different it's, it's interpretations. Mostly, it's mostly yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. And so it, I I see it really as a placeholder for a yeah. larger discussion around healthfulness right. and wellness. That. Yep. Um, and the reason that there's an attraction to that term natural is because organic still doesn't really work that well for us. Mm -hmm. um, there is a definition for organic and, and we start to, I'm, I'm talking a little bit out of my zone here, but I'm pretty sure it, it starts to limit the uh, amount of sulfites that you wanna use, which can create other problems in the winemaking process. Um, so you started to go, go there, but we really do need to defend our turf mm -hmm. and wine is natural. And by the, the, one of the biggest things on Wall Street right now is plant-based. You know, when you go through and you look at the kind of stuff that mm -hmm. is being manufactured in the food segment, it's plant-based. So guess what wine is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, Go figure. And, and you know, you, you would think that people would, would gravitate toward that, that they would understand that, that they would, you know, go to this product because it's better than spirits and it's better than beer in terms of its natural well, it's, process. It's but, more natural and it's healthier, right? A healthier option. So therein lies the, therein lies the, the, you know, the pivot that we need to start mm -hmm. to make. And, we, yeah. and, and by the way, it, that doesn't mean that you have to change everything you're doing, but let's start with doing for your own winery, some basic market research. Talk to your club members, talk to, you know, get some ideas and, and run it by them. They want to be engaged, by the way. Mm -hmm. They want to, they want you to talk to them and, and uh, ask them what they feel about things. Would this positioning, uh, would you feel more favorable with this positioning? Mm -hmm. Do your A and your B samples, do, you know, your, the marketing that you should do before you invest tons of money, but you don't have to take a lot of time. And I don't think we have a lot of time, honestly. We've got to make these changes no. because if we mm -hmm. can't reverse the trends that we're seeing, we're going to be ripping out more vines. There, there is no other alternative. I think you For wanted sure. to go. Yeah, well, that's one, one side of the healthy and balanced lifestyle conversation, which is so important. But if we pivot and pull up uh, slide number 24, and we can take a look here at formats, growth rate and share in formats. And I think that's the other thing, as we're seeing here, 375, you're seeing explosive growth. While it's a small share today, explosive growth. Part of that is, you know, the younger generation, I call them the Lunchables generation. Everything was portioned out, pre-packed, mm -hmm. and allowed for them to engage in activities in moderation because the pack size was the snack size, right? Yep. And 375. I love when you say that, by the way. The pack, <laughs> pack size, size is the snack, snack size. Uh, so the, the 375 does that, right? I don't feel like opening a whole bottle of wine because I might waste it. Mm -hmm. Well, now at 375, we can each have a glass with dinner and we're not wasting and I can have it be integrated as a healthy part of lifestyle. And the fun. Uh, I'd also add that it suits behaviors more. You know, you Absolutely. can take it outside. You can take it, you know, to the park on well, a boat. Well, that's where yeah. cans right. and, and the Tetra the Pack cans. come mm -hmm. in as well. Meeting people at the lifestyle and where they want to be consuming and engaging. The more that we as an industry can continue to recognize that and meet the consumer where they want to 
mm -hmm. you know, have an opportunity to engage with wine, right. the more opportunity for point of entry that we'll have. For the category longevity. in general. Yeah, yeah and, and the point of entry is the critical one for me because yep. when, when we're fine winemakers and let's just say you, your lower priced wine or your average wine is maybe $40 or something like that, you're creating a barrier against that young consumer getting trial, mm -hmm. right? It, it's too much of an investment. That's a pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap ones maybe, but, <laughs> but it's a pair of shoes. And uh, that's a barrier. But if you cut the size in half, that 20, be, that 40 becomes 20, right? right. Reducing right. Um, if, if you go to a, a split. And then if you, if you start getting down to, I mean, you look at what's happening in stores right now that with RTDs, mm -hmm. um, it, it fits a lifestyle that's, that's more active. People are, are grabbing stuff to go. Uh, cans, I, I've been an, a naysayer on cans because I, I just look at the, you know, the quality of cans, what it does to wine over a period of time. Um, I don't think it has the insulative quality that uh, that a glass bottle has. It doesn't feel right to me in the same way that uh, when I was growing up, a, a gallon jug okay, boomer. didn't feel as good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I've kind of been, eh. but um, I've recognized that we, as an institution, as a, as a as an industry, have really missed the boat on on this. I'm just raising my hand, especially um, because. It, it's not really about delivering in cans for young consumers. It's, it's crossing the serving size barrier. Um, it's single servings. We're not mm -hmm. talking about single servings. And that's those single servings that actually do deliver trial. As an industry, if we start to focus on single servings and we start to do trial, uh, and I've talked to people that make very good wines and they say, oh no, that doesn't suit us. Mm -hmm. that's, I talked yep. to somebody yesterday and they said, no, we can't do cans, it doesn't suit us. And maybe, maybe not. But it does suit an end mm -hmm. um, in the same way that um, we've gone through change over the, over the last uh, 40 years. I remember, some people still remember maybe, when we went from uh, lead foils to, mm -hmm. to tin or other, yeah. other foils. That was a big deal. Oh, my God, we can't get rid of lead. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now we laugh <laughs> at it, right? And then, oh, man. And then uh, in, the in America, we've, we've you know, had the screw cap debate for for decades, We're still Plum, having it. Plum, <laughs> still we still are. Plump Jack kind of blew by it and said, "Hey, you know, we can we can produce the wine that's just as good, right. and you know, with either thing." So, you know, the, the screw caps have been more accepted. But you go to you go to uh, New Zealand and Australia in particular, and most of their wine is in screw caps. Um, with the with the ready to drink single serving, that is, I believe, going to be the gateway for our success. So Rob, there's a bigger question that was just asked. So obviously we're talking about uh, reducing friction and point of delivery, but the question is, is part of the problem with consumers is the amount of choice we have across varietals, regions, brands, wineries. Is that also an inhibitor? Yeah, you know, it, with wine, um, it's, it's both a blessing and a curse. I agree. Uh, because, um, you know, we talk right now about tariffs as an example. Uh, I've been interviewed uh, at least a dozen There's times. There's a lot of tariff questions. So yeah, I want to yeah. get into that now. It's a good time. And I, I really, yeah. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's, a, it's a more of a short-term thing versus a long-term thing. Uh, uh, Amy, you want to talk about? Uh, I'm just saying if we pull up slide 19, we can actually cross over a little bit on both the varietal okay. question mm -hmm. as well as tariffs. Because here on this slide, what we can see is the red dot shows if there's a negative growth rate in any given uh, varietal category. Green is a positive oh, yeah. green dot. Mm -hmm. And then these, uh, the actual tower in blue, those blue columns are the full share of market. So as you can see, Chardonnay still holds the largest varietal share of the marketplace. However, it is in decline. It's a negative growth rate at the current moment. So um, as we look at this, it's really interesting to correlate to say that of the growing, um, the, the varietals that are in positive growth today, nearly every one of them depend on imported wine. Mm -hmm. yep. Right, yeah, right. Uh, and so, Provence Rosé, Prosecco, you know, absolutely. sparkling. And category. almost all of them are EU except for Sauvignon Blanc from right. New Zealand, uh, which New Zealand. is not in tariff. Yeah. And, uh, so that is an interesting component on the tariffs. If you, I don't want to spend a lot of time with that because uh, we don't have as much control over tariffs. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And what I'd rather talk about are solutions to the problems we have. Okay. Um, some people think that the tariffs may create uh, some opportunity for domestic producers. and. Yeah, a little bit, but it, it's short term and, and we have other problems to deal with, with uh, uh, domestic importers who built their businesses 
uh, with relationships in, in the EU. So yeah. I, I don't think on the whole it's it's the right thing for America personally, um, mm -hmm. but um, you know, it's we don't have as much control over that, so we have to deal with the hand that's dealt. Which is why I want to focus on, on the marketing and the sales side, I think, largely. And Rob, you had mentioned trial being really important. We talked yesterday about getting trial outside of the tasting room. I think slide 14 uh, shows a little bit about tasting room traffic, and we see that it's trending mostly down, a little up in, um, in Sonoma, but otherwise overall generally down. So talking about ways to take your product to market in ways that are more meaningful to create those emotional connections with consumers across all demographics um, as one solution to the question you posed earlier, Paul, about how do we capture mindshare when there's so much competition out there. So those are things like just could be simple things like getting in the market and doing different dinners and events um, or doing them in you know a more regular and meaningful way. Right. And yeah. it maybe isn't the same old format of, right. hey, mm -hmm. let's have a very formal eight-course wine dinner because that's not right. what people are eating or consuming from the exactly. health standpoint. Mm -hmm. However, still bringing your proprietors, your winemakers, and your you know brand advocates into market to yeah. meet that consumer where they are right. is hugely important to be able to eventually give them a reason to come back out to tasting rooms. Exactly. Exactly. That's kind of the, the summer conversation yeah. in D2C, but most importantly, a point of entry that right. you can't just depend on your winery at its current location, but you need to actively be engaging both conversationally, whether that's through digital and or right. in real life, IRL, yeah. to, to engage in ways that people want to interact. The right. reality is it's a blue ocean strategy. No one's actually perfected this yet. Yeah, and I think sure. that yeah. what's Rob's shown over the last couple of years and we've talked about endlessly is that the tasting room model, while it's the, the best model to convert customers, it's broken, it's limiting, it's got a lot of functions that we've depended on it too long. Yeah. And the numbers are showing that it's still declining. And even though maybe you're making more dollars per person, the reality is it's going to keep declining as more want, you know. Uh, slide, right. slide 23 right. is, a, is a, a good one to, to look at with that point, Paul. Um, and you know, I got to tell you, beer and spirits producers, uh, you know, they're looking across the river and they're they're saying, how come we can't be like wine with the the kind of direct to consumer mm -hmm. business that they're able to to generate? So you know, that is a strength of, of our category, and yet you know, and we're still growing. Um, uh, but this is from uh, Wines and Vines Analytics and uh, Ship Compliant. So, and so thank you for this slide, you guys. Um, but you, you can see what's happening to the growth rate. It's it's falling just like the rest of the category, but, but, even in, even in direct. But the reason that it's falling is because uh, I believe that we've over-indexed on tasting room. Yeah. And there's a there's only a few wineries, and uh, uh, kudos to Amy's winery. They're really investing in the digital side and in creating better experiences to capture those customers at home and yeah. touch them in a scalable, large way. And that's where their numbers are gonna look very different than these numbers, I and think. So the, yeah. so the point is, we have to do a better job of taking the experience on the road. That's the, that's the term that I've used uh, in the last year. That's not, that's not the, in, the entirety of the discussion. It's a placeholder for a larger discussion. There are a lot of things that you can do to get outside of your tasting room, but I mean, the reality is, and, and I, I do have customers that are like this, they've been around for a long time, they have a certain size tasting room, there's only so, so much traffic that they can flow right. through, and they get all the traffic they can get. At a point, there's no more, you, you get a certain adoption rate from the number of people that come in, and you have a certain amount of decline from the, from the club mm -hmm. as people yeah. that roll off. And guess what? There is no more growth because mm -hmm. of your, you're limited by this facility, and and, uh, and asking I, people to come to it, which is a huge and, and ask. I've, I've, to said this be, I've said this before. Name name another uh, per, any sort of manufacturer like cars, where it, cars if, show up. if you had to go, yeah, if you had to go to Detroit to pick your car up, I guarantee you there wouldn't be as many. The car sales right. aren't so good right. today, <laughs> but uh, but it, you know it would be even worse because nobody would would want to go to Detroit, and so. Obviously, if we can't get through the three-tier system for the smaller producers, you've got to figure out how to take your show on the road mm -hmm. in some form or fashion. You've got to create an experience, and there are a billion ideas in Duval's point. Nobody, you call it blue ocean? Blue, blue ocean strategy. I've never heard that, but I, I, yeah. I like it. I like, I like the ocean. You like nice. the ocean, yeah. <laughs> um, there are uh, a, a billion ideas. Nobody has got the solution. Uh, we can steal from each other. That's that's all cool. Um, but I, but I think though. we got to steal from spirits. spirits. Mm -hmm. right. So in speaking to that, uh, this is actually from uh, Wenty. Uh, Justin Nolan is one of the best digital guys. He's actually asking, are we not delivering the right message, but are maybe we're not delivering the right message to the right channel, which is actually mm -hmm. possibly true too. We know that some of the success from wineries that are doing really well, narrow cast to their right cohort, talking to the right people at the right time. And I think Justin's right on. You know, We're just speaking in mass as opposed to micro-targeting on behaviors. Right. So, and he's awesome, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. 
And also to the point of direct-to-consumer sales online, I mean, that's where tools and digital and social can really be utilized. I think there was a question about how can we use social media better, and by integrating data with your social media, you can target ads, you can target demographics, you can target by geography to really get your message in front of the right people at so, the right time. So this speaks to what you're saying, and I love what you're saying, is that every little winery that hears this thinks that it's a big lift, and what it is is a cultural change. We're actually mm -hmm. having to change the way that we're hiring, training, and bringing people into the thing, that it's not completely hospitality focused, where you're looking across selling wine, it's mm -hmm. they have digital acumen, they know what e-commerce looks like, they're speaking the languages yeah. that we all use every day. They know what Blue Ocean means. They know what Blue Ocean means. <laughs> CX. Yeah. CX. Yeah. And I think to that point, too, it's important that we're looking outside of the industry for those skill sets Amen. and then mm -hmm. training them on wine and or on luxury or from your brand values. And you can Absolutely. actually then see a, a faster uh, leapfrog impact to the overarching business. And that was a strategy that you know, <laughs> and has been successful for us personally, as yeah. you mentioned. Thank yes. you for those nice compliments. And Justin is doing a terrific job. Yeah. And it's because he came from outside of the industry. That's right. Mm -hmm. Was able to encourage us to push the limits in places that may or may not have felt comfortable before, but right. they were restrictions right. we were putting on ourselves. Absolutely. And I think that's a bit of what we talk about from, you know, how do we talk about health and balanced lifestyle? Will we feel restricted? Well, that might be perceived restriction because when we look in Alcbev, our partners and cohorts over in spirits and beer aren't feeling the same restriction. They're not at all. So, you know, how can we continue to push not only in digital and the way that we communicate, but also the health and wellness messaging, all the those. way we're looking yeah, formatting, the way that we're interacting with each and every consumer out there, right. and again, bucketing not by age groups, but by those psychographics, yeah. so that we then are speaking to the right cohorts with the right message, and that isn't a, you know, one size fits all. It isn't. It's multiple sizes, multiple Absolutely. things, and multiple efforts, and it requires you bringing in, between you and Tricaro Family Vineyards, bringing in Kelly Burke, you guys both brought in really great digital experts, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, unusual. I have to say that's one of the most <laughs> amazing things I've seen in the last decade in my career, seeing you bring in new talent into the industry and letting them loose to push you out of your bubbles, both of you. You want to talk about uh, data, Paul? You want to talk about, uh, we got that slide on data. Sure. Uh, pull it up with, the, it's uh, slide number nine. Uh, nine. Number nine. Yeah. Right. Since you're Dr. Doctor, I'm Dr. I'm Dr. Digital and Dr. Data, uh, you know, look, this You've got is lots a, of Ds now. Actually, <laughs> you know, it's been fascinating the last year, the amount of evolution that wineries are investing in understanding their data. Um, and slicing it and dicing it into pieces. And I think that we are in the, um, just the nascent beginnings of what's about to be unlocked. And I was having a glass of wine last night with Amy and we were talking about how uh, customer groups should be sliced into buying cohorts and how we should have different journeys and paths and communication structures based upon a casual consumer can get a lot of emails, whereas your best consumer you're picking up on the phone and calling. And we have to slice and dice those into those those different internal cohorts, mm -hmm. and we'll gain lots of dollars. So the investment you have in an employee here um, pays dividends, you know, five to 10x, whatever you're paying them, yeah. if you get them in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also wouldn't say you have to isolate this as DTC only using data. Agreed. You can create an integrated strategy where maybe you have a, a retail, a huge retail placement in Florida, and then you combine that with social media ads, earned media, paid media, um, a DTC promotion, it all comes together to lift up your brand and create some buzz. So by combining different strategies, that's one way also to really stand out by then just rather than putting things in silos. And I think that's exactly, it's a great point because that's exactly how the consumer works today, right? Mm -hmm. It's an omni-channel force out there. No question. I may be stopping at Target to pick something up, but I forget to get something else, so then I'm on Amazon, put some mm -hmm. in the cart, and then the next thing I know, you're at a friend's house who brings someone else over who's got right. repping something that you're buying, right? right. So it's yeah. not necessarily that you're fully digital or fully brick no, and mortar. It's omni And recognizing yeah, that omni-channel opportunity that has only continued to accelerate in the way that is segmented where and how people purchase anything for that matter. Yeah. Or touch your brand for that Absolutely. matter. Absolutely. Not, not just purchase, but even how they're touching yeah, and researching it. How they it. interact with how, it, how they want it. They're in the right. shelf Googling it or using Viv uh, Vivino to take Absolutely. a picture. And what does that reflect for your brand? Yeah. Absolutely. I think, yeah. Juliana, you mentioned it earlier, and I think it's so important is the fact that we need to not only understand what's happening with our consumers, but mm -hmm. if we actually keep our heads up and look out of category mm -hmm. across other food and luxury right. products, consumer goods, we get a much greater insight on what's about to happen because this Absolutely. health and wellness and well balance and all these things started happening over a decade ago everywhere else. And we felt like, oh, we're a natural product. We're immune to that. Well, now it's caught up. And so if we keep our heads up and we continue to look out there and understand right. trends in other categories, consumer products categories that are relevant Definitely. and tangential to where we are, 
are, then we have a better opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah, I, I think, think mm -hmm. I was at uh, influencer marketing, I think mm -hmm. it's a great example. Fashion was using that before Absolutely. any other industry uh, and bringing new products to users through social media and combining influencer marketing. And now, you know, some wineries have adopted strategies. Some like it, some don't. It's not the right fit for everyone. Yeah. But it was something that was started first in fashion. Well, I love what we're talking about is feedback loops and, and, and really diversifying the way we touch our customers, right? And so, I, you know, I'm drinking this Hint water. And uh, anyone that knows it's an amazing water. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a $120 million business with 40% direct to consumber. How much did you wow. pay for that water? Uh, $1.99 actually is yeah. what I paid for yeah. that while and they water. but the, still having a hard time with but what an amazing thing they have this feedback loop they, so this they, water was free okay <laughs> I can give you some of mine if you like yeah. um, they do trial with their direct consumer they go with the data that they get from their direct consumer into markets like Publix and say this is how our, our water's behaving they do price tests they do mixtures they do all kinds of how they informs their ad buying is mm -hmm. based upon this mm -hmm. feedback loop Nike has went in the last six years 40% direct. And it's not because of just the uh, margin releases, because of that feedback loop that they're getting. It's pretty. It's Whole30 approved, too. It's Whole30 approved, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. This, um, uh, final pieces, we're actually out of time, which is always amazing to me. But, yeah. uh, wow. but before we get there, uh, maybe each of the panels can come up uh, with a, a single idea that is good that might help somebody uh, move on through where, wherever they are and, and press through the, you know, the next thing. And uh, so if I had to say, you know, what's the one thing that you might be able to do, uh, I would go back to the engaging with your club, you know, mm -hmm. figure out, uh, and I actually was talking to Ellen McCoy yesterday at, at Bloomberg about this very thing, and she, she thought it was, you know, fascinating, and she wanted to know who was doing it. I know there are wineries that do this, use their club as a, a, a way to ask questions, marketing, you know, gee, if I did this, would it be, you know, how would you look at our brand? Mm -hmm. um, do those simple sort of questions, use them as part of your board of advisors, if you will, and, uh, and, and see what they say. Now there's a problem because we're actually trying to sell to a, a new court, so you have to actually know who you're talking to and, and make sure that you're, you're measuring the right things, make sure you're asking, uh, you know, the young people as well when you're doing that. But, Whatever your idea is for your winery, I'd suggest you engage with that club. They want to tell you what they think. They want to be included in the solution. Um, they're already drilled into your, uh, into your winery and, and your brand, and so they have a vested interest, and, and it only helps your relationship with them. So that, that'd be my suggestion. Amy, do mm -hmm. you have any? So I would step back and not talk about treating any individual symptom that's out there, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. recognize the opportunity to link together all of the big um, pillars that are rocks, if you want to call them, we talked about today around healthy, balanced lifestyle formats, getting a uh, trial, um, taste trial and points of entry, and really summing that up in one word, it's about collaboration. Cross industry collaboration with one another, just like you know, two and three generations ago, yeah. all of those farmers and winemakers were coming together to get marketing messaging and own the idea of natural and a you know healthy and balanced part of lifestyle. So yep. collaboration and linking these that's, together. Yeah, it's great. Um, I'll provide something pretty tactical and straightforward: digital content and video, primarily. <laughs> Invest in video. Create videos of your winery, videos of your winemaker, interviews. You could do them on an iPhone or invest in a production team and some and a videographer. But you know, work on your content. Create video content that can be shared. Um, and that tells your brand story. How would you measure success in that? You can measure, it depends on the channel, like if you're putting out on social media, you're, now we're looking at engagement, how many comments is the, the video getting, how many links, uh, clicks is it getting. Sure. Using unique uh, links as well on the post, you can see how many people are clicking back through to your website by sharing that video. So there's different tools and metrics, but um, those are some of them. Okay. Doctor? Yeah, I'm going to be kind of a, a more broad in that. I think that we need to invest in a diverse customer-centric culture. Mm -hmm. um, and then that includes um, how we look in, at our customers and analyze them, both trade and DTC, but also how we touch them through digital channels or in person. So that culture drives us. And it means also bringing people from outside the industry to look at other categories. So people like when Amy's bringing in her talent from outside so that they can influence us because there's great things happening at, um, you know, whether it's Casper uh, or uh, Allbird Shoes or all these great brands are sold digitally, native Warby Parker, um, or even big brands that like Hint that's doing 40% and splitting up and doing, so we can learn from them and bring them in. 
and guide us forward, but we have to start culturally changing because otherwise we are myopically just doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the conversation will continue, by the way, next Tuesday at 930. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's actually a, a register widget you can register for, for the next uh, session, so you can go ahead and do that. Uh, you can also go on my blog, SVB Online, and uh, uh, go figure out how to sign up for that as well. Uh, there's still a lot, a lot to talk about, and, and we'll enjoy talking about that next week. But um, if you want to, uh, one other thing, if you want to make, if, uh, with all of the, the changes in laws about privacy, We've had to change the way we, we email use. Uh, if we didn't know how we got your email as an example, we had to uh, eliminate you from our database for emailing uh, things like, okay, here's, here's the date for the state of the industry. So um, if you want to continue to participate in the state of the industry survey, um, then please feel free to, to uh, submit your contact information to me and I'll, I'll uh, make sure that uh, it gets to the place it needs to be or um, anybody else for that matter at Silicon Valley Bank that, uh, that uh, is in the wine business, they'll, they'll help you get that, uh, make sure you're in the databases. Um, finally, got to thank uh, Amy Hoops and Juliana Colangelo and Paul Mayberry, the, Thanks for the doctor me. of digital for all your efforts. Thank you. uh, I thank you, uh, the studio audience and those that have helped us create this survey in a partnership uh, and this research report that brings forth some of these issues and, uh, and solutions um, to the, the industry that we face and that we love. Uh, tomorrow's gonna be a better day in my opinion. Um, we're gonna learn more about uh, what we believe uh, next week in the next video, uh, con uh, video uh, telecast. Uh, I encourage you to sign up for that. But uh, until we see you then, thanks for your participation today and uh, look forward to you seeing you next time at Silicon Valley Bank.